expired. The gentleman from Florida, Mr. Franklin, is recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to our witnesses, too, for what I'm what has definitely been a long and tedious afternoon for you. We appreciate your patience. Uh, my first question is for Director Ray, and uh, for the sake of consistency, I've asked this question of our witnesses in the other hearings from Department of Justice, the DOD, and the Metropolitan Police. Uh, Director Ray, what, um, what security agency would you say has the primary responsibility for security, the phys physical security of the Capitol? My understanding is that's the U.S. Capitol Police. Okay, well that's, that's been the consistent answer, and as has come up uh, multiple times here this afternoon, uh, we're now into several hearings regarding this issue, and we've yet to have anyone from the Capitol Police. It's, uh, it seems to me that's a waste of time until we can get those folks here in the room. Uh, General Pyatt, um, you had mentioned in your testimony that I think we had 350 guard troops that started the morning uh, here, or um, uh, that showed up for duty uh, initially in the morning doing traffic and crowd control. Is that correct? That was the total. They had less than that for, for two shifts, so that was a total for two shifts, but they were out on traffic control points, unarmed, and on crowd control locations throughout the district. Okay, traffic and crowd control. Uh, how many were ultimately activated by the end of the day? By the end of it, it, when the day started, about 350 guardsmen were activated. By the end of the day, that, that number in, increased probably to six to 700. I'd have to get the right number for you, sir. Okay, and, and that uh, the balance of those troops that showed up later in the day, what, what were they doing at the beginning of the day? They were most likely in their civilian location. We got the full mobilization order at, at 3.04 by the Acting Secretary of Defense, and then we were able to mobilize and recall people. So they came in from either their civilian workplace or forever, wherever they were, and that's very, very fast given the circumstances. And when, what time again was that that they would have been activated, say, from their civilian jobs and told to head? And I, I assume they were told to head straight to the armory to pick up their gear? Congressman, yes. 304 is when the uh, Acting Secretary of Defense gave the full mobilization order for the D.C. National Guard. Okay. And so from the, the traffic control and, um, and crowd control mission early in the day, uh, not only did the mission change, the command structure, the tactics, the rules of engagement, I mean, there's a complete change in mission set from what they thought they might have been getting earlier in the day to what ultimately happened, correct? Correct, Con Congressman. They were working for the Metropolitan Police Department, and now they were going to move to a federal, federal police department, the, the Capitol Police, which they had to be re-sworn in, but they had to be re-equipped, reconfigured for this new mission for civil unrest. I know there have been some talk that you might have commented about the optics of how it looked having guard troops there at the Capitol. Um, you weren't sure you said that, but in the heat of discussing contingencies, it, it might have been said. But uh, I think I've also heard you say, too, that um, uh, you discussed the difference in the mission and really what our guard troops are trained to do versus the special uh, type of training required to conduct that mission in the Capitol. Could you expand on that a little bit for us? Yes, Congressman. I, I don't recall saying the word that, that day because the optics were clearly a mob storming the Capitol. That was not an important uh, uh, consideration at that time. What, what, what was important was getting the Capitol secure and to rapidly clear the Capitol when you had uh, criminals with, with perhaps lethal intent is what we were, what we were tracking. You had innocent civilians mixed. Uh, that's a pretty high uh, level uh, task for, for very well-trained law enforcement to do to take uh, soldiers who are out on traffic control points or postured to do that, to put them into that situation. Uh, they simply, we just weren't positioned to do that. Very good. Um, yeah, I would just like to make it clear that I think that the guard did a, a remarkable job in responding in the time frame, especially given, given the circumstances. You know, it's interesting, you know, it, uh, we have 45 members of this committee and this has been a noticed hearing for a week, and it still took us a half hour to get the hearing started. So I think in light of everything happening that day, it was pretty remarkable. And I just want to say my hat's off to all the folks who did make that response. Personally, I feel it was a failure in Capitol leadership, Capitol Police leadership, but unfortunately we've yet to have any of them here before us to testify, even though there's been ample opportunity, and I hope we get that uh, eventually. But thank you all for, for your time this afternoon. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. In the FBI's view, the top domestic violent extremist threat comes from racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists, specifically those who advocate for the superiority of the white race. That is an absolute flat out lie. It is not our greatest threat. Not once in his speech today did Merrick Garland mention last summer's BLM riots or skyrocketing crime on our streets, the riots we still see 
week in and week out. How about Merrick Garland? You condemn this man on your screen, Justin Tyran Roberts, arrested for shooting five people in a 20-hour shooting spree in Georgia over the weekend. You know why he did it, according to investigators? They insist he was intentionally targeting white, military-looking men. That sounds racially motivated to me. He didn't mention that. No mention of this black-on-white crime because it doesn't fit their divisive narrative. These are stories that are actually happening in America. How about we stop issuing fake warnings about crime based off of political agendas and start prosecuting all criminals, no matter what color they are? When you're up there, are you just getting tired of being told you're a racist, I'm a racist, everybody watching is a racist? Yeah. They have to talk about January 6th, and they have to talk about things that divide us on, uh, along racial grounds. It is, it is so wrong, but that's who the Democrats are today. They're this radical left-wing party, and they have nothing else positive to talk about, so they have to go here. Yeah. You know, you look at January 6th. Everybody has said it was a tragic day. It never should have yep. happened. They wanted people that were violent and destructive put away. But, you know, I was looking at Senator Ron Johnson. He looked at hours and hours and hours of tapes, and he was like something like 40% of the people were just let in by Capitol Police. But they don't talk about any of that. And you have SWAT teams showing up in California at somebody's house trying to rouse them out of the house for walking around taking selfies inside that Capitol. It isn't right, Congressman. Or how about the couple in Alaska who weren't even in the Capitol? I mean, look, you're right. We Republicans have been, conservatives have been consistent. We condemned the violence that took place on January 6th, and we condemned all of it that took place all last summer with all these, uh, in all these metropolitan areas around our, around our great country. The Democrats are the ones who have been hip hypocrites on this. They did, they, last summer was fine. That was a righteous cause. But then they focused on, on January 6th. But the couple in Alaska who weren't even in the Capitol, the FBI kicks in their door, holds them at gunpoint, handcuffs them, interrogates them for four hours. They got the wrong couple. And then they take their phones, their laptop, and their pocket-sized copy of the Constitution. Talk about, I mean, th that, there's got to be irony in that, that, that fact alone. So, yeah, th where's the consistency that we would like from everyone? We've been consistent. I wish the Democrats would do the same. Yeah. Well, there's my pocket constitution. I carry it with me all over the place. <laughs> and I'm in Texas, Congressman. Come and take it. Usually we're talking about guns. This time I'm talking about my constitution. In the FBI's view, the top domestic violent extremist threat comes from racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists, specifically those who advocate for the superiority of the white race. Garland did not provide any numbers or statistics to back up this claim, but pointed to past racially motivated shootings and attacks, as well as the January 6th riot on Capitol Hill. Noticeably, Garland spent his entire 26-minute speech without even mentioning the summer of riots one time, simply ignoring months of attacks on police and federal buildings and cities all across this country as if it just didn't happen. Steve, I think this shows how politicized Biden's DOJ has really become ignoring vi radical violent groups like Antifa, like BLM, simply because they support the left-wing agenda. Yeah, unfortunately, it's another example of two sets of rules or two sets of narratives, really, in a way. And the narrative being spread here, of course, is that January 6th is, uh, was a, a riot that somehow endangered the American Republic, which is not in any sense true. It was an unarmed riot, inexcusable for, to be sure, but unarmed. No, not one person has been charged with having a firearm inside the Capitol that day, and it lasted a few hours. To try to compare that to weeks of rage and carnage across the summer last year in 2020 um, is just totally ludicrous and illogical. Unfortunately, that's right where Merrick Garland went. They're essentially pitting Americans against one another by labeling it ba via basically a race war, which is essentially what they're implying with that statement. I don't agree with it. And I think it's absolutely horrifying to see that you have the DOG, DOJ essentially being weaponized against the American people. There was, a, there was a rally in Chicago of white supremacists on January 25th. And they put out a national call and they got 80 people to show up in Chicago. And according to one expert, five people were from the Chicago area. Out of about, what, eight or nine million people who live in Chicago, there were five people, right? And so a lot of this uh, the southern, the, relies on the Southern Poverty Law Center and the statistics that they put out and the media regurgitate that. And so I think we have to be careful. Certainly, I, I do not trust the media uh, on this issue because they, they have proven themselves to be uh, you know, not reliable when it comes to being partisan and pushing certain narratives. So um, is white supremacy 
is there some in the United States? Absolutely. Is it the most uh, biggest threat to, to America? I think that's overblown, and I think that the administration is pushing it for their own political reasons. You know, it seems to me that race relations in America in recent decades have improved so dramatically that things like, for example, interracial marriages are totally unremarkable in America today. Uh, and it is not considered acceptable in polite society at all to have racist views. And yet we have people like Garland and Joe Biden who want to insist that the country is systemically racist. Are they essentially protesting a struggle that has already been won in American culture? You know, there has been tremendous progress in this country. And, and for a lot of folks uh, on the left to, to, as they're saying now, this is, you know, voting rights, it's Jim Crow 2.0, that there's been no progress made since the 1960s or even the 1860s. I mean, that, most Americans understand that's ludicrous. I mean, that is gaslighting, right? That is an absolute gaslighting right. of the American people. And so I think, uh, again, in our normal everyday lives, we do not see the bogeymen that are being made out. There are not Klansmen walking around the corner. There are not white supremacists uh, gathering on street corners. And so I think, uh, you know, that ultimately falls flat to the American people because that's not what we see and we live in our day-to-day -day lives. Right. And we understand that racism is really, uh, you know, has, has been a thing of the past. I mean, does it still exist today? Sure it does in certain areas. But is the, is the country systemically racist and oppressive? I don't think most people believe that.